Good morning. It's another beautiful, beautiful day, a little warm, so I hope you stay cool today. Um, do we have any announcements? Does anybody want to talk about Vacation Bible School? <laughs> Doesn't it look wonderful up here? <laughs> I do want to remind the trustees that we have a meeting this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock in person, so don't forget about that meeting. And they still need people to mow, so uh, there's a sign-up on Genius Link, a sign-up sheet on the, in the North X, or call in and leave Terry a message. Let us join together in the call to worship. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. So we follow Christ's command to love one another. As he loves us, so we must love one another. By this, everyone will know that we are his disciples, if we love one another. Let us stand and sing the opening song, Love Lifted Me. <coughs>
your love has lifted us, that your joy is present, that we come to you to worship, to love, to express our love back to you. Oh God, may your spirit move in us, may you speak to us, may you give us strength and guidance for the days to come. We ask all this, we pray it, in your son's name. Amen. so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not give and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. 
This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Let us sing the song of preparation, pass it on. come to a special time of prayer this morning and uh, first I want to share some requests in general for the for the congregation we want to we want to continue to lift up Ella Maddox uh, I know she is continuing to struggle with bad headaches and so continue to remember her we want to lift up Bess Moffat this is this is uh, Dorothy's neighbor Bess and she is she's facing some cancer treatment she's, had cancer in the past and was in remission, but it's returned. So lift Bess up in your prayers. Of course, we want to lift up uh, BBS uh, this coming week. A lot of stuff happening there, and so we we want to just pray for the workers and the kids and the safety, and pray for Stephanie and, and she's biting her lip right now in anticipation of, of BBS yet to come. And thanks thanks to Stephanie for her great leadership as we prepare for BBS. Um, I know. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Patty Morgan's uh, request that she made last week. We want to pray for, for mom, and we want to pray for her friend um, that's that's having some difficulties as well. 
And I want us to take a special time, and I want to ask these folks if they're comfortable to come forward. Uh, Hannah and Campbell and Chase, Todd, Dustin, if you'll just come up here and stand in the front. Um, we want to have a special time of prayer for them. These folks are getting ready uh, in two weeks to go to Nashville, Tennessee on our behalf. They're going to go uh, on a joint mission trip with the youth group from Chowers. They, that's called the J unit, as in Jesus unit. And so uh, Todd has bravely chosen to be one of the uh, chaperones. And so I'm going to be praying for you, Todd, uh, especially. Uh, but uh, they're going to be our missionaries. These folks are going to represent us and some kids from 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 the other church as well. Um, actually, there's a few different churches represented um, because J Unit is kind of a community youth group as opposed to just uh, the uh, <coughs> the um, the Chalmers Church's youth group. So, see these faces. Be praying for them uh, June 27th, especially through July 2nd, because they are going to be in the mission field on our behalf. And and we've used funds from the Chaos funds to help help some of these kids go. Some of them raise money through the J unit group, so they already had the funds. But so this is these are your missionaries, and so we need to keep them in our prayers. So let's bow together and have prayer for all of these concerns this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in a spirit of love. As the song says, it only takes a spark it only takes a spark of your love shared with others to really see your love burn bright in all of us. And we pray for these folks that have concerns this morning. We lift up Ella and her ongoing battle with, with migraines and have your hand upon her. We pray for, mess, for Bess as she begins this uh, a uh, series of cancer treatments that she's going to be facing. Have, it her hand, have your hand upon her. Give her strength. I know, Lord, how much this church means to her, and so help us to be the church to her during this time. We lift up uh, uh, concerns that Patty Morgan shared for mom, for her friend, we ask that you'd have your hand in, in both those situations, Lord. We come to you for VBS, this opportunity where so many kids from the neighborhood will and from the community will be here learning about you, praising you. Keep us safe. Keep us wise. Give, give the, the workers energy. Lord, we selfishly pray for the weather that you help keep it fairly cool. We can do many activities outside. So be with us this week and help us to just have your spirit working within us. Now, Lord, I pray for these individuals before us that have committed to a week of mission work. I live up to you, to, up to you, Campbell, as she prepares for this. May she... Trust in, in your spirit and your love to guide her. Pray for Chase as he enters the mission field on your behalf. Give him strength and guidance. And pray for Dustin. Help him as he works on the mission field. I pray for Todd as he chaperones and leads and, and does the work as well. May your spirit be present in him. And I pray, of course, for, for Hannah. Pray for her as she has this experience. I pray for all the other young people. I pray for Jamie Matthew as she chaperones as well. May your presence and your hand be upon them and may your agape love be working in, in and through them during this time together. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight as we move toward the time of the message. And I ask, also ask, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful and pray with, with all our hearts and in earnestness the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and deliver us out of the front. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You can tell I'm out of practice saying that, praying that prayer, so I apologize. But thank you all for being up here, and, and blessings to all of you on your trip. So be supportive of them in prayer as we continue forward. You all can sit down. that he had served over the various years as he was he was starting to get up there in age and, and this preacher was you see he was one of the founding fathers of, of this church that had been established many years before and he had learned under the original founder of this particular church he had seen this church grow through their evangelization efforts to start new churches like the first one in many towns and, 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 and cities across their part of the world. But see, he saw a problem, and that problem was that the light and the fire that had started their movement was starting to, to dissipate. They, they had lasted and even thrived for many years, but at this point in history, they were a few generations removed at this point. In time from, from those pioneers who had passionately started their movement. And of those who were part of, of the close-knit circle that were taught under the direction of the founding leader of their movement, he this, this preacher was the only one still living. And so he felt it was really important to put into words this compelling message for the sake of the renewing of the people of this particular church and all of its affiliates and churches started. See, this elderly minister saw too many other influences diluting people's passion for faith. A faith of many that had previously led to the church to step out boldly in their communities, to share the good news, indeed, as much as in word, to those who desperately needed it. So he wrote a sermon. He wrote a sermon in, in the form of for lack of a better term, a strongly worded letter to be shared with the congregations. So he had it dispersed thus, and he hoped and prayed by the Holy Spirit and the grace of God this sermon would spur them back to the passionate faith they once expressed in days gone by. So he starts out in his sermon by reminding them of his deep connection with the founder of the church. He tells the congregations, I'm reminding you of this connection I had with the founder for the sake of fellowship, this word koinonia, that the founder so wanted us all to have. In other words, their deep connection, connectedness with each other, and of course with, with God and with the Son, Jesus Christ, was so important to him. Now see, the preacher also knew that people in the churches had been arguing because some had taken the position that their way of thinking about and living out faith was superior because it integrated what the current scholars and philosophers were teaching about faith as opposed to what their church founder taught about faith. But the preacher made it clear. He said, don't tell me you're still tight with God while you're hating your brother and your sister. That's akin to walking in darkness. And don't act as though you don't have any sin in your life. Don't act like it's all the other guy's fault and you are blameless. That's like telling God, hey God, you're a liar. And the preacher goes on in this vein until he gets to, to one of the main points of his message. And he prefaces his main point by saying, okay, what I'm about to tell you, this isn't a new command. This is it's something you've all heard before. But this command needs to become new again to you because it is essential to us as his church. So 
So let me quote this key point of his message directly. I just happened to have a copy of it right here, handy. He said, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Yes, the preacher I'm talking about is, is John himself. John, the, the, the apostle, the disciple, who we credit the fourth gospel of the New Testament with three letters in the New Testament, as well as the book of Revelation. And maybe you figured out where I, went, where I was going before I told you, but maybe you didn't. But I wanted you to in, I wanted to introduce this new series to you in such a way in hopes that you would see how relevant these words believed to be written to many churches that John had influence on are still so relevant for us today. John was writing to churches that, that yes, they were different than us and in a much different time, but also people with issues, difficulties, various people dynamics, just like us, us and also in a time of their history of existence that had similarities to what we're going through. And just so you know, even though I presented this story to you in a way that made you think perhaps it was of more recent history, the, the circumstances I shared with you are were accurate. John was taught, discipled, by the founder of the church, which of course is Jesus himself. And according to William Barclay, it's believed John wrote what we know as 1 John around the year A.D. 100. Thus, he would have been an old man and all the other original disciples had passed on and actually all the rest of them had been martyred for their faith by that time. John would have been the only remaining of the original 12 disciples still left alive. Also, I want you to listen to Barclay's description of the context of the times John was addressing in his first letter. By AD 100, certain things had almost inevitably happened within the church. Many were now second or even third generation Christians. The thrill of the first days had, to some extent, at least passed away. In the first days of Christianity, there was a glory and a splendor, but now Christianity had become a thing of habit, traditional, half-hearted, nominal. Men had grown used to it, and something of the wonder was lost. Jesus knew men, and he had said, most men's love will grow cold. Matthew 24, verse 12. John was writing at a time when, for some at least, the thrill was gone and the flame of devotion had died to a flicker. Barclay continues on in his commentary on 1 John about many cultural influences that were tempting various factions in the church to dilute the gospel in order for their message to be more palatable, if you will, with the latest scholarly spiritual philosophies of the day. One example, without going too deep in the weeds, was the Gnostic movement, which among other things tried to claim Jesus only appeared to have taken on physical form. I know this is weird. But in reality, he was, he was, he was on earth in spirit form. This is what the Gnostics thought. And this, of course, caused debate about whether Jesus really died and was resurrected since the Gnostics theory was Jesus was really only spirit to begin with. I know it's, it's really weird, but this is what some of the, the, uh, the current, that, that time's thinking was. So we can understand John's dilemma and his need to clarify truth to these early churches, entering into their second and third generations of, of existence. We remember John is the one who wrote in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And then, uh, several verses later, he said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, the fact that Jesus was a real physical flesh and blood person was beyond any argument for John. 
It was just fact. It was truth. And if anyone should know at this point in time that Jesus was in the flesh, it was John. Because he was there with him. But again, the heart of John's message in his first letter that we're going to see over and over again is the essential need for us as Christ followers to live out this agape love. Now, there was another John at one time that had a certain message, and I don't, I don't necessarily agree with and think of everything that, that this John, that being John Lennon, said. But I think the Apostle John would agree with Lennon when he wrote and sang the song, All You Need Is Love. Especially if we're talking about agape. Now I know, I know I may also sound like a broken record because I've mentioned this many times before, but Jesus summed it up when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And his reply was, and, and I paraphrase, love God with all you've got, right? Heart, mind, soul, strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, all of these, the law is surrounded by, all of these. Everything from the law points to these two things. And both of the loves used, by the way, in that passage are agape love, just to be clear. I know I've shared this before, and for most of you it's review, but let me again clarify that there are four different words in the, in the Greek language, which is the language of the New Testament, that we translate into English as love. And no wonder we're confused about love, right? Another reason why English, for those not from English-speaking places, is one of the hardest languages to comprehend, let alone master. But in light of this, I think it's worthwhile to review briefly these four types of love mentioned in the New Testament. The first one is storge, or family, familiar love. We love because of our familiarity as we do with the people in our family. An easy way to remember this is it sounds like stork, right? Storge, stork. And who brings the new addition to the family? The stork does. So storge is family love. It is love regardless of commonality and or friendship because our familiarity due to being family. The whole, the old cliche, blood is thicker than water. Is, is the essence of storge love. Next one is eros, and this is romantic love. And we hear the word eros, and it has the same root word as a more familiar word in our own language, which is erotic. Thus, we might be tempted to connect this to lust and, and sexual desire and lack of control thereof, but this kind of love is a good thing inside of a marriage relationship especially when it's accompanied by the other types of love. But Eros is the second love mentioned in the Bible. And then there is Philia. This is the love of a friend. We think of it as brotherly love because we know Philadelphia, the same root word, is a city of brotherly love. But it is brotherly love as is built from common interests, common goals and purposes. See, I got my Cubs up there. A sports team develops Philia for one another because they're united by one purpose, to be successful on the field. They are, they are united in purpose. The same is true for soldiers or police officers or firefighters. It is why we can often see such a bond in groups like these. Thus, when one, one member of the team's interests interfere with the common good of the entire team, that, that's when uh, problems can arise. And I found what a, a gal named Alyssa wrote, a writer for Christianity Today said, to help us understand philia. She shares that the words philia and phobia are opposites. If we have a phobia of something or someone, we are pulled away, we are drawn away. If we have a, a phobia of heights, we're not, we're gonna be, we're not gonna go, we're gonna stay away from high places. We do our best to avoid that thing or that person. But if we have philia for someone, it's because we are drawn toward them by our common purposes and interests. And philia and agape can really be interwoven, but they are not exactly the same, but they are closely related in nature. 
And Jesus, he connected the two when he said in, in John 15, 13, there is no greater love, agape love, than to lay down one's life for his friends. But the love we're really focusing on in the, in the weeks to come is this agape. Some form of the word agape is used over 200 times in the New Testament and 35 times alone in 1 John. Now the King James Version translates agape as charity, but our modern understanding of what charity is doesn't quite do justice to agape's meaning. Yes, there is a spirit of agape when we give financially without expectation of a service or product in return, but agape goes even deeper than that. When we agape someone, we aren't worried about ourselves. Unlike the other loves, it doesn't come just from emotions or feelings or familiarity or attractions. Agape is a choice we make. Again, as Alyssa Roque put it, agape requires faithfulness, commitment, and sacrifice without expecting anything in return. And thus, I came up with this acrostic that I plan to use for us to come back to throughout, throughout this series. And that is that agape stands for this. Always giving, absent of personal expectation. Always giving, absent of personal expectation. And as Christians, we understand that who God is and what he has done is the ultimate measure and expression of agape. He demonstrated this love through Jesus Christ. We didn't see Jesus ever stopping and saying, hey God, hey disciples, hey, I, I, I'm going to go to the cross only if. You know, I'm, I'm going to die for you only if didn't say that. No, he went to the cross. He did it when crowds were hating him, when his friends abandoned him, when for that one moment even God had to look away and forsake him in order for Christ's sacrifice to be completed. For that moment when Jesus was able to say, it is finished. That's a God name. Jesus. Always giving absent of personal expectation. And Paul wrapped it up when he said this in the book of Romans. But God demonstrates his own agape love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now I believe passionately that agape is what has drawn us to God in some form or fashion. It is why we are here. It is why he had the faith, it's why we have the faith that we do. And, and, and the way that we've experienced agape is through how others have shown agape to us. So if that's the case, all we need to do, right, is just to go out there and, and agape and agape everybody, right? Here's the problem. As many things in life, it's easier said than done. Allow me to quote Alyssa wrote one more time. She says this of agape. Agape love does not come naturally to us in our sinful state. However, it does come naturally to God and is an integral part of Him. By drawing closer to Him and experiencing His love, we are able to begin to understand what this real love means. Only through him can we show and experience agape love. So that's where we're going. <coughs> that is why we are taking a deeper dive into 1 John. Because this little book in the New Testament can give us insight as to what it means to be agape people. 
Because I believe if this church would really get serious about living out agape, God's unconditional love to our community that so desperately needs it, we'd start to see amazing things happen for the sake of God's kingdom. And understand, when I mean God's kingdom, I mean his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. This is we pray in the Lord's Prayer, right? You know, Larry Anglin convicted me a few weeks ago. He says, why aren't we praying the Lord's Prayer anymore? We need to pray the Lord's Prayer again, okay? And, and it is. It's a beautiful prayer. It's, it sums up the way we need to pray. But my issue with praying the Lord's Prayer every Sunday is, are we just saying it? Or do we really mean it when we pray it? Do we really take those words to heart? So we're going to pray it some more often, Larry, but, but hear me when I say, are we really praying the Lord's Prayer and considering what it says? Because if we really passionately prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe God's going to convict us more and more of the truth that we need to agape people for his kingdom to come. So I want you to, I want to encourage you to tune your hearts to the dial of agape in the weeks to come. Now next week we're going to celebrate VBS, but then there's all kinds of agape that's going to happen with VBS, right? But so we're going to take a break from the theme next week, but then we're going to return. So, but keep your hearts dialed in to agape. Take this little acronym again to heart and, and, and ask yourself, where are you with agape? Am I able to, to give my love absent a personal expectation? How close are you to being able to do this? And I know I know I got a long way to go. I know I'm not mastering agape anytime soon. But I know it is his will for me, for all of us as a body of Christ, to live out agape. So let's commit to open our hearts and see if we can really grow in our capacity for agape love. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, guide us as we go into this, knowing that you were the perfect model of, your, of agape love, that you gave without, without expectation, that if there was just one of us that needed to be forgiven of our sins on this earth, you would have gone to the cross anyway. But we all need it. We all need to know that we receive this love and that you call us because we have received it to share it with others. And this is the power of your good news. So help us to look more deeply at it, consider what it means for our own lives, and act upon it. Help us, Lord, as a congregation to take these things to heart. We pray this all in your son's precious name. Amen. Now we're going to invite you all to stand as we close and sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. <clears throat>
I hope everyone has a good week. I hope it's a cooler week for all of us. I know the past few days have been quite humid and hot, but uh, uh, pray for good weather, especially when it comes to Bible school. Um, I would like to do something a little bit impromptu, and I want to—I I know we're all here, so I want—I would like to ask the health and safety team if we—if you have a few minutes that we could meet in the fellowship hall. Uh, after worship here. So if, if everybody can do that, and if you can't, I understand, but uh, if, but if you can, please uh, let's meet back in the, the fellowship hall here. Let us uh, have a time of, of prayer together. We're going to say goodbye afterwards to the folks online, and then uh, we'll dismiss again from the back to the front after our benediction. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be held blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.